Chong Kim, and I'm a survivor of sex trafficking. What I'm about to share with you may be hard to believe, but it's true. And I'm sharing this because I'm trying to break the cycle. It started uh, when I was 19, and when I met a guy that I thought really loved me. And um, he told me I was beautiful, and I fell for him. And we dated for about three weeks. And when you have your female friends with you, you don't think about the red flags. Um, it can happen to anybody, um, especially when you meet someone that says you're beautiful, he wants to take care of you, he loves you. And um, especially when you're young, we have this Cinderella fairy tale story that when we meet someone, we think he might be the one to rescue us, to be the prince in our life. And that was what I thought. And so for the three weeks that I knew him, um, he groomed me. He would ask me questions about myself and, um, and anything I liked, he said he liked too. So I thought, you know, great, you know, he was really into me. And then, um, then one day he said, I'd like for you to meet my parents. And it was out of state. And I asked my girlfriends what they thought. And um, of course my friends supported me and they said, you know, if a guy wants you to meet his p parents, it means he really likes you. And so I thought about, you know, that he would be the one. I would have visions of what it would be like you know, for us to be together, and I really loved him. I wanted to take care of him and have a family and everything. And so, and with my friend's support, I said, okay, I'll go. And um, during our road trip the first day, I was so giddy, I was so in love that I didn't see the red flags. And I didn't, um, I remember sitting in a car and all I could think about was, I'm going to meet his parents. The only fear I had was the fact that he was Caucasian and I was Korean. I wanted to know, would they like me? Um, were they um, open to interracial relationship? Um, that was the only fear I had. Um, Everything else, I remember I would hold hands with him. I would look out the window and just imagine my life, you know, with him. And I would look back and smile, and he would smile at me and constantly remind me that he was in love with me, that I didn't see any signs of changed behavior. We were supposed to go to Florida. We ended up in Oklahoma. And we stopped at a abandoned house. And I remember seeing the boarded up window. And I said, what are we doing here? And my first thought was, um, because I thought we were going to Florida and I remember seeing the trees, they weren't palm trees. It was gray outside and drizzly. And I thought, boy, Florida looks ugly. <laughs> because I was used to the um, Hollywood films of what Florida looked like. And I said, what are we doing here? And he said, oh, I have a homeless friend. And I thought, oh, how sweet. Um, I don't know if it was just naive or that I just had faith that um, a man that I was dating would um, treat me right. And so I said, I'll sit in the passenger seat and I'll wait for you. And, you know, I'll wait for you because I wanted to go ahead and go <clears throat> um, to meet his parents. And that's when his behavior changed. I started doing research since then. I started finding out more and more cases. I would volunteer in juvenile detention centers. And I realized we were repeating a pattern we were stigmatizing our children. If they run away from an abusive home, we call them troublemakers. We send them to juvenile detention centers. 
instead of asking them why they ran away. Instead of working with families to reunify the problem, to give some type of um, help to the parents who are struggling. And I realized that we have the label for these kids called child prostitutes. These children are not prostitution, are not prostitutes. They're victims. And they should never, there should never ever be a label of, of the word prostitute next to a name of a child. <laughs>